good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Crafting and Crime Daily, the show where I, your host, Rebecca, recap live trials. Now, we're currently waiting on the trial of Michelle Traconis. It is scheduled to start on Thursday. It had been postponed from earlier this week due to the dismissal of one of the jurors. It was an alternate juror, and I don't know why the juror was dismissed, but hopefully we're going to get opening statements on Thursday. So, today I'm going to bring you another true crime story. Don't forget, before I get into it, subscribe and hit that notification bell. When you hit the bell, you want to hit all so you don't miss a single episode. This is also available as a podcast on YouTube Music if you are subscribed to that. So, let's get into it. So, Lauren Astley, she's an 18-year-old who had just graduated from high school. She was born in Boston, Massachusetts, lived with her parents in Wayland, Massachusetts, all of her life. She went to Wayland High School where she graduated that June of 2011. She excelled in soccer and tennis and was very musically inclined. She played the French horn. She sang in an a cappella group when she was younger. She had the leading role in the musical Annie in, in a local theater company. And her friends described her as smart, funny, a very loyal friend, and very talented singer. So she goes to work on July 3rd, 2011. She arrives at work around 9.45 a.m. And she leaves work about 6.45 p.m. And as she's leaving work, you can see that she's on her cell phone. And reportedly, she's on the cell phone with her ex boyfriend. This is a boy, Nate Fujito. I say boy, he was 18, but he was a boy that she had broken up with right before graduation. She was looking forward to going to college. She had had enough. They had been dating since they were sophomores in high school. They had a very rocky relationship on again, off again. They would break up, get back together. And she broke up with him. She's like, I'm done. I'm moving on. And uh, he wasn't very accepting of this. Now, Nate, during high school, he was the star wide receiver on the football team. And he had some college prospects to play football. So on July 3rd, she leaves work at 6.45 p.m. Now, her friends start texting her. This tight, tight-knit group of friends that the two of them had, they shared a lot of friends in common. They're texting her. And she's not responding. So the friends call her father and they're like, you know, she's not responding to our texts. And he's like, she didn't come home from work. So they go looking for her. They call the police. They find her car near the beach. She had a red Jeep. The windows were rolled down. Inside the Jeep was her computer and her purse, but she was nowhere to be found. So her friends actually spent the night on the beach thinking, well, maybe she'll come back. Dad files a missing persons report with the police, and now the whole town is looking for this girl. Meanwhile, the police are like, you know, very, very early on, they suspected that Nate might have something to do with this. So they go over and they interview Nate together with his mother, Beth. So Lauren had broken up with Nate on her birthday, April 1st, 2011, her 18th birthday. She breaks up with him. That's a terrible April Fool's joke and one that he did not take very well at all. He became depressed about it. He started losing interest in things, distancing himself from his friends, and he really was not accepting of this breakup. He was no longer looking forward to college. He didn't show interest in anything. He just said he didn't care about anything. Lauren, she kind of friend zones him. So, because they shared a lot of friends in common. So she and her friends decide they're going to have this big graduation party in June. 150 people. They rented at this big tent. But they invite Nate because, you know, he's one of the group of friends. So they invite Nate. Nate shows up to this party in June intoxicated and he kept trying to get Lauren to talk to him now her friend describes that she saw her do like this movement and she thought you know trying to get him away from her so 
he gets angry when she refuses to talk to her and he punches one of the tent poles. The tent collapses. Lauren goes and finds her mother. She's crying. She's like, he will not leave me alone. He keeps harassing me. He won't let me dance with other people. So this is what's happening a month before that fatal day on July 3rd, 2011. So by now, after this graduation party, he's really depressed. Now he's starting to drink heavily. He's no longer contacting any of his friends. So his mother, that particular day, July 3rd, 2011, while Lauren is working at the mall, Nate's mother, Beth, shows up at the clothing store and she says, listen, would you just talk to him one time and see if you can figure out what's wrong with him? And she's like, oh, okay, I'll do it. So that night at 7.05, when they look at Lauren's phone, they see that she had sent a text message to Nate at 7.05 p.m. I'm here. Or actually, she just said here, H-E-R-E, here, which meant she was at his house. So police get a search warrant for Nate's house. In the garage, they find blood splatter on the garage floor. They, see, they find this cluster of bungee cords there where there's blood on them. They find a pair of sneakers in the garage that are covered in mud. They go into Nate's bedroom to search it, and in a crawl space in the ceiling of his bedroom, they find a black backpack. And inside this backpack, or a gym bag, it was a gym bag, inside this gym bag were bloody sneakers and bloody clothing. So Nate's arrested for the murder of Lauren. So the following morning, which is July 4th, 2011, her body is discovered in a marsh five miles from her home. Apparently, when she showed up at Nate's house that night, he lured her into the garage, slit her throat, strangled her, I don't know in what order, <laughs> um, and then took her body and dumped it in the marsh, then took her vehicle and parked it at the beach. He also took the keys to her vehicle and dumped them down a drain. Police were able to find those keys. When they found her body, she had a bungee cord tangled in her neck, and they found that she had had her throat slit. Nate was arrested. He pled not guilty by reason of insanity. His attorney said, my client had a major depressive episode, so he's not responsible for what he did during this episode. Well, the jury wasn't buying that, and they, they came back with a guilty verdict. Nate was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. So sad, an 18-year-old, the rest of his life in front of him. After the sentencing, Lauren's father gets up and walks over to the parents of Nate and hugs them. And they so, so appreciated that. You know, they've, they've lost their son forever now, and Lauren's gone forever. And I thought that was such a kind gesture on the part of Lauren's dad to do that. Now, Lauren's parents have set up a memorial fund to help educate teenagers on how to have healthy relationships. And it started this whole conversation about breakup violence. Apparently, it's a lot more prevalent than I ever thought it was. So I did a little research into breakup violence, and they define it as um, a relationship that ends, and what happens is this emotional surge of uncontrollable anger. And sometimes the result can be physical or, or emotional, verbal. And in this case, it ended up in her death, Lauren's death. So statistics show that of young adults between the ages of 14 and 20, a lot of them have experienced some form of dating violence. 
it says here of teenagers teenagers who are in abusive relationships, 3% will tell an authority figure, 6% will tell a family member, and 75% will tell a friend. So most of the time, the families, they don't even know this is going on. So if you have teenagers out there, maybe you should talk to your kids about their relationships. And if they're suffering from some kind of abuse, this is the time to find out about it and get them help. If they've had a recent breakup, you know, I remember my son being very emotionally dragged. He had, he had this one relationship that where he was just emotionally drained from it. Uh, he, he did finally end it, but I never thought like get him help, but I think we should. I think we, it can't be ignored. So I hope you enjoyed this true crime story and I will have another one for you tomorrow. Have a great Wednesday. I'm going to be live tonight. Craft with me Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Central Time, and I think maybe doing some watercolor painting. Yeah, so have a great Wednesday. Hopefully, I'll see you tonight. If not, I'll see you tomorrow for another true crime story or maybe even the opening statements in the Michelle Draconis case. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.